Zoom. <laughs> 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 Hey everyone, I'm Jens Ansu and this is my design studio. This is episode two of designing a folder. And if you watch the previous episode, this is pretty much as far as we got. I had some uh, sketches by hand and some relatively loose sketches on CAD. What I usually do when I reach this point is I let a design simmer for a couple of days. In reality, what happened was that this design simmered for the better part of three months. And I've been trying to figure out exactly why that was. Well, for one thing, it was over the summer holidays uh, and things were just running at a different pace. But also I was facing some uh, difficulties with the mechanism, which kind of left me running my head against the wall. The main reason for that was that I simply just didn't take enough time to sit down and just force myself through it. One thing that I've realized as a designer is that, well, you will reach a point where you bump your head against a wall. And I also understand that if I force myself through it, most of the times I will get out on the other side. This is simply just the terms of being a professional. If you give up, well, that's definitely not um, gonna get you anywhere. I didn't at all give up. I just had other projects that I could work on. And, and this project, I also really felt that it needed a longer time to simmer than, than usual. With this project, I'm presenting the first folder project that will become shop built. Uh, this summer, I introduced the 25th anniversary and so sheep's foot version, this is shop built, which means it's mainly built by my team in my shop, but I'm less involved than with my full customs. And uh, this project we're working on today will also be shop built. So it will be generally more available. It will have a somewhat lower price than my full customs. I'm doing this for several reasons, but one of the main reasons is I can never meet demand by working by myself in my shop on customs one at a time. I know that with a project like this, I can get more knives out in more hands and satisfy more people. So that is that was the main focus with this project, but also to avoid keeping me as a bottleneck in production. Uh, that just it's not feasible for a longer term goals in the company. So this project has been one of the, the hardest for me to actually get past this first sketch phase. So this drawing here, which is a printout from my cat, illustrate pretty well the process that I've been going through. And even though at this point, this is purely a matter of design and not mechanism at all. This is the steps that, some of the steps that this, has, this design has gone through. This top drawing here resembles pretty much the one we have here, which resembles pretty much the one we have here, which was my first sketch for this project, which was done in a bar in New York when I was traveling in February this year. This area here is part of the construction that holds the pivot pin, pivot screw, and the button lock itself. This was a detail that for me is super, super important because this will emphasize the function of the knife or the function of the lock. I like 
to have details that draw your eye into what's most important in a design. And in this case, the lock is super important. This detail here helps explain the knife to you without you having to know what a button lock is or how it even functions. My thought is that I should be able to hand this knife to somebody who's not a knife person and they will intuitively understand how will this function. Very early on in the design process, I realized that I wanted this new design to feature a clip similar to the clip that I have here on the Isola. It's a little early in the process to think about clip and clip placement, you might think, but it's super important to actually position the clip for its function, but also because then you start thinking about lanyard uh, detail on a knife. And for me, even though I really rarely use a lanyard on a knife, I think it's a really, really important feature to have on every single folder so you can secure your knife to your belt with a piece of paracord, for instance, if you go sailing or backpacking or uh, rock climbing, your knife is a essential piece of gear and losing it while you're out there can be maybe not catastrophic. Well, for some, it, it, for some situation, it's catastrophic to lose your knife. So having a lanyard uh, option is super important and, and of course this should as, as well. I've actually constructed an inner liner and I would actually go as far as, as not just call it a liner but a chassis where the full construction of, of the knife is held together by the inner mechanisms, the inner chassis made from titanium. So the combination of the blade, the chassis and the spacer gives me the construction. The handle itself gives the overall construction some strength, but in, re in theory, it would actually work without the handle attached, which opens up much more possibilities to use whatever handle materials that I feel like using. It could be softer materials like wood or ivory or more dense materials like uh, G10, micarta or even titanium. But I'm not restricted by having to choose materials that have a structural stiffness to it or a structural capability to withstand the force of the knife itself. I've solved that by adding the chassis on the inside. At this point in the process, I decided, okay, it's, it's time for one, to draw it in the 3D, and my team helped me do that. And then we did a 3D print of it, which I have here. And then this is where things really start to get exciting. While this is not functioning like with the flipper tab and everything, it still opens and closes. I can attach the clip. I could see, okay, the clip was actually not working as well in a physical form from this uh, size standpoint. So I wanted to make it shorter than on the Isola, but I could start seeing all the details in hand. I can feel it. I can imagine how would this feel using for cutting, but also just the mechanism itself. How would that work? And that's where 3D printing really, really helps speed up the process because we could also have gone straight into production, but 3D printing, we can do that very, very fast. So from this point on, I, I actually have something where I can decide, okay, is the ergonomics exactly like I want it, or does it need any changes? 
Please support this channel by visiting my website at ensoofdenmark.com. There's a link below. Save a knife tip today and use a pry tool instead. In this case, it's the Astra pry tool. Actually, there's more. So now we actually move past 3D print and into actual materials. This is, I would, I would call it a mock-up of the actual knife. We're starting to work with the actual materials. This is a G10 handle that we milled out. It's a titanium chassis. It has the right screws. It has the right backspaces. I changed the clip now to a much better size. But now you can actually start seeing all the details, start making choices on texture in the titanium. We still have some adjustment of the mechanism itself. This is working somewhat. The flipping mechanism needs some adjustment and, and the lock itself needs some adjustment. But we are so close. And I think this is one of the things that that happens when you get excited about something. Then start, things really, really start taking pace. And I'm just so overly impressed by my team and their effort into making this a reality. So in six working days, we went from a 2D sketch and to super close to the final product. I really like adding new details to each new knife. So I develop the detail from knife to knife and I take portions of an idea and let that inspire the next knife and next knife. So for, for this one, the lanyard goes through the handle side here and then out of the spacer here. And I, I really, really like how this turned out. In the first episode, I mentioned that I wanted this, this to be a, a front flipper. That's a difficult word. But I actually backstepped a bit on that. And the main reason was that I was working with a design language that in some areas would differ quite a bit from the design language that you have come to know with my other knives here. So I actually wanted to take some elements from my pre previous models and add into this design as well. So I went with a more traditional flipper tab for me, which is, I guess you would call it a traditional flipper tab but it, it, it ties bonds to the isolate folder, which is one of my newer models here. So that is the main reason why I went with the standard flavor tab, but also because that's the one that I prefer most. I've handled and owned a few front flipper knives and I've never really become accustomed to them. The standard flipper, however, is, is one that I really, really enjoy. One thing that actually was a little different for this project was that my team said to me, Jens, you need to name this before you start making files and send to us because we've tried before to have files on Dropbox saying new folder, new folder, <laughs> to new folder 3.2 and as you can probably imagine that can give you some kind of misunderstanding plus when you start naming all the single files on cat new folder backspace and new folder clip and then you have to go back and change all of that into a new name that's just not ideal. It's actually, for me, it's one of the most difficult things about this industry is naming each knife. That afternoon, I was like, oh, okay, I was going, I have a list on my phone with potential knife names and I was like, ah, mm -mm. And I actually ended up calling this the Aros, 
Aras is the Latin word for Aarhus, which is the second largest town in, in Denmark. And I happen to live very close to Aarhus. So Aras is the new name. And I can tell you exactly how that name came about. Aras is also the name of an art museum in Aarhus. And incidentally, that same day, I, I got a letter from them with a uh, reminder that I had to renew my membership with them. And it was right there, an envelope with the name Aros on it. And it just seemed fitting. Also, I have a thing for four letter words containing the letter O. We have the Isola, we have the Orso, we have the Neo, and now we have the Aros. So everything stays together in some kind of family. But um, let's take this apart and uh, I'll show you their, their inner details. So here we have the main chassis construction. This is what holds the whole knife together. This encapsules the locking mechanism. It, it has the, the back spacer, it has the clip, everything here. So in theory, you could assemble the knife without this. I wouldn't recommend it, but in theory you could. So I actually like that the handle itself is doesn't hold any um, strength to it. Everything is held together here. And it's a solid construction. This is milled out of a solid chunk of titanium, then reduced to two millimeter thickness for the main body. But you have these small islands that goes through windows in the handles. And one of the things that I really enjoy about this is that you would be hard pressed to see anything like that in a standard production version of a knife just because this is extremely expensive way of, of reducing a chunk of titanium into a less big chunk of titanium. It's, it's just a ex really, really expensive detail to have to have the um, pivot and button detail go all the way through. That's one of the benefits of running your own shop is you can do whatever you want. This concludes this episode, episode two of designing what have become the Aros button lock folder. There will be an episode three where we present the final knife, so stay tuned for that. But I really hope that you enjoyed following this process from the first sketch from a restaurant in Manhattan, a I don't know, two, two minute sketch over our sketching in the previous episode to my cat work, 3D print to a mug up of what is super close to be the final knife. I really enjoyed showing you my process. And um, if you have any questions along the way for, for ideas, or if I need to explain some of my process uh, more in depth, please let me know in the comments. And uh, I will answer any and all questions and, and comments. Um, maybe not immediately, but I will get to them along the way. So hope you enjoyed this episode. Uh, remember to hit like and subscribe and tell your friends. Uh, I'd like this channel to grow and uh, spread out the word. Thanks so much. If you want to support this channel, please visit my website at answerofdenmark.com. There's a link below. On my website, you can find items like this Astra, the modular fixed blade.